Hi, I'm Thomas Schwingel, a professional cinematographer based in Los Angeles. Ever since the advent of LED lighting, I've often wondered if these newer sources can be as sharp and crisp as traditional sources, such as tungsten and HMI, especially when you want to create really defined shadow patterns. In this video, I'll explain the physics of hard light, and I've created an experiment to compare some of the hard light options that are available to filmmakers on modern sets and help us maybe determine what units might perform best, especially on smaller sets with a limited budget. And to remove any bias, I've created a test. The scientific method we all learned in high school comes back. The source that everyone will be the most familiar with is the sun. We consider it a hard source because of its relatively small focal point in our sky and the generally crisp shadows it creates on the ground. This only applies on clear days without atmosphere, smog, or other particulates that can diffuse the rays reaching the ground. Because of our distance from the sun, the rays that reach the earth are entering our atmosphere in roughly parallel angles. This creates hard shadows because the light is appearing to come from a single point source. Now let's say we traveled towards the sun and got close enough that it filled up most of our vision. Well, you'd be burned to a crisp, but let's ignore that for now. At close proximity, it would actually behave like a soft source because of its size relative to subject. The rays would be coming off of the sun at all sorts of angles and the resulting shadow behind you would be diffused. We should talk about shadow quality as an indicator to judge a light's sharpness. Using celestial terminology, there are two terms that define the parts of a shadow, umbra and penumbra. Umbra is the area in complete shadow. No light falls here because no part of the source's rays penetrate beyond an occluding object. Penumbra is the fuzzy part of the shadow. This happens when a softer, larger source can wrap around an object creating partial shadow. Take a look at this aperture lantern. When placed close, it casts softer light on a subject because it spreads out the underlying LED source. If you walk the lantern far enough away, for example, so that it appears to be the same relative size in the distance as, say, the sun appears in the sky, the lantern would then behave like our sun and create hard shadows after a subject. The rays of light that are making it this far are roughly parallel and thus create a hard shadow. The usable light for camera exposure would be small because we've walked far away from the source. In fact, in order to film this clip of the harder shadow cast by the lantern, I had to turn up the camera's ISO to around 3200 which is above the base used in the rest of this video. A single source can be both hard and soft at the same time. It is a matter of how close you are to the source which determines whether you are receiving mostly parallel rays or scattered rays. I can always turn hard light into softer light if needed. The same cannot be said about a soft source in a practical way. I cannot quickly, efficiently, practically make a soft light into a hard source. Hard lights allow for believable sunlight, interesting shadows, artistic reflections, strong edges, and ways to selectively illuminate areas of the set that might be hard to reach or far away. In recent years, when newer lights have been introduced on sets where I'm shooting, I find myself sometimes questioning if the sources are as crisp as the older sources I learned on. Don't mistake me though, modern lighting is amazing. The energy efficiency, color control, remote programming, portable hardware, and creative possibilities have revolutionized the recent years of filmmaking. For example, instead of using multiple tools to recreate firelight, a single unit can come programmed with a function that mimics these effects. Yet the source that creates this lighting is now generally a larger area than older lights. It is a cluster of diodes that is emitting this light. And if your fixture creates more than a single color, then the unit can have a mix of different diodes that each produce its own color hue. And the mixing of these hues within the unit is what ultimately creates the desired output color. In short, it could be more difficult to make a hard light or point source when you have so many little sources clustered together. There are newer modifiers to help shape LED from what is essentially a soft point source into a more focused source. Lenses, beam adapters, and focusing tools attached to the unit can help create a more concentrated light. I've wondered how these tools compare to classic fixtures, so I developed this test. I want this test to be based off a realistic lighting scenario one might find on a film set. A scenario in which hard lighting is not only desired, but needed in order to accomplish the effect. Let's say you're filming on location at a home. There's a living room with a wide bay window. It is raining out, or the film is faking rain by running it down the glass of the bay window. 
An effect seen in films is when the water droplets running down the window are projected onto the wall on the set by a hard light outside the window. It's a dramatic way to show that it's raining. You can see that in these scenes from both Watcher and Minority Report. One would need to place a hard light outside the window to project the many small shadows of the droplets onto the wall of the set. This requires a truly hard source because the droplets are small and could not easily resolve against the far wall if the source isn't providing parallel rays to carry the shadows across the room. Look at this theoretical location. Inside the set, the director has placed the camera for the shot and she, he, they desire to see the shadow of the rain droplets on the wall in the back of the shot. And let's call this about six feet of space outside the window to place a unit at the correct angle in order to pass through the glass and display the shadow of the droplets on the wall. An experienced cinematographer would know that they can gain some distance, i.e. make the source harder, by using a mirror to get the light farther away from the window. Just like the example with the sun, get the source farther to make it appear smaller and more of a point source. Of course, you can only go so far without losing foot candles due to the added distance. But going from six feet away to 30 feet improves your chances of getting the needed effect. But let's say logistics don't allow for this. In our imaginary scenario, using a mirror, we can get the unit about 20 feet from the window, and it has to project the droplets another six feet onto the wall. Is it possible? I could pitch an example where I know this is possible, but this is more like a real scenario one might find when shooting, and this allows us to create a test where we can see where some units fall short at the task and some might succeed. We're close enough to the subject where some supposedly hard sources may not actually complete the task. We're in a realm of possible failure. Before the experiment, I have to give a shout out. I teamed up with Los Angeles Grip Lighting and Studio Rental, The Fun Ton. They've been a great supporter of my work, and if you ever need rentals in LA, I strongly suggest you hit them up. Great people and well-maintained gear. Links to their website and social media are in the video description below. To recreate the idea of our imaginary house diagram on Funtun Stage 1, we simply needed a light source, a subject to stand in for the glass window, and finally a set wall where the projection of the subject shadow would fall. I wanted a way to visually compare how the hard light sources were resolving at 20 feet away, i.e. the distance in our fake location. I borrowed a testing method used by Jay Holman and Katie Williams for American Cinematographer in a 2018 article about diffusion. I'll link that article below. In their test, they projected the shadows of stand-in objects at an oblique angle across graph paper in order to visually show how the shadows were being affected by diffusion. In my test, I'll do the same projection across graph paper, but I'll be using a single matte black cone to reduce any chances of bouncing glare or reflecting. In the path of the light, also at 20 feet, I placed a thin piece of matte metal that had a crisp pattern machine cut into it. If the light passes through the metal in parallel rays, then farther away, there should be a clean pattern of light and shadow that exactly resembles the pattern in the metal. This would mean success for projecting a ring pattern in our imaginary set. I also added a very fine black mesh. If the rays could project this tightest of patterns across the six feet, then the rays are truly acting in parallel. I had just enough time in my one day test to look at these 11 variations of units. A tungsten park hand with a very narrow globe, a Joker 400 HMI naked without a lens within the Joker fixture, a Joker 400 HMI naked but within an ellipsoidal reflector housing, a built Jolico 400 using a 19 degree lens, a 2K tungsten open face lamp, a 750 watt Source 4 ellipsoidal with a 19 degree lens, an Aperture 300D Mark II with the hyper reflector cone, the Aperture 300D Mark II but with Aperture's 19 degree spotlight max, a Nanlux Evoke 1200 naked with no control, and Nanlux Evoke 1200 with their adapter to add an industry 19 degree lens, and finally an Airy Orbiter with their adapter to add an industry 19 degree lens. Using a digital caliper, I measured the point source of each unit. This was an approximation. Uh, I wanted to be able to compare the approximate size of each source to the shadow results to see if source size was a factor. For tungsten, this was a best effort measurement of the glowing filament. For HMI, it was the best effort measurement I could get of the discharge area within the globe. And for LEDs, it was a measurement of the width of the diode face. I also measured the width of any modifiers like the face of lenses, which could act as a secondary element modifying the internal point source. And next are the results, which contained a few surprises and some results I had kind of expected. 
Here are the shadows cast by the 11 different unit configurations in order of perceived sharpness. This is subjective. We have to visually judge these results and arrange them by what looks sharp to us. What is interesting is we have a couple units that are casting sharp shadows of the cone, but we are getting a double shadow. The pair of shadows are relatively sharp, but it is like we have two lights next to each other. What I think is actually happening is the reflector at the unit meant to focus the light is acting like a mirror and is making more than one projection of the point source in the lamp. And here are the labels for the units in question so you can compare for yourself. The results show us something noteworthy. All of the units wearing a 19 degree lens, no matter what type of source, HMI, tungsten, LED, they all fall in line next to each other. In fact, the shadows cast by a few of these units wearing a 19 degree focusable lens are very similar. And some of those same units, not using the lens attachment, actually rank as having a sharper shadow when projected naked. Well, what I think is happening here is that the glass of the lenses are acting like a secondary new source. The light is being magnified and focused through the glass, and its point source size is getting increased, resulting in a softer shadow than if the light was simply projected without the lens. This doesn't mean the lens attachments are failing at their job or doing something wrong. Take a look at the light meter readings at the test site. The aperture unit is now pushing out more than double the foot candle units than when it was in its standard mode. Uh, same with the Joker 400. And the Nanlux Evoke has tripled its foot candle reading at the platform site with the use of a lens. Lens attachments serve their purpose of focusing a light into a controllable area and providing an increase in foot candles. However, it appears that the physics of focusing the unit actually increases the general size of the light point so that we cannot obtain the pinpoint sharpness we are testing for. I can recall seasoned gaffers on sets claiming that a naked, raw HMI would give sharper shadows than using a lens, and that appears to be proven here. This test is seeming to show that a raw source, without a modifier, gives the sharpest projection of the light, even though it may not be the most efficient use of the output. As far as the size of the discharge area, uh, meaning the face of the LED or the tungsten filament, the measurements I made don't seem to fit into any discernible pattern. Naked LED units with a wider point source seem to win the cone shadow test, but we should keep in mind that the tungsten and HMI units had built-in reflectors which may have bent and stretched the size of the point source in their effort to focus it, much like how we saw that the addition of a 19 degree projection lens changes the pinpoint source and actually softened it a bit. Now moving on to the heart of the test, we wanted to see if we could create rain droplet shadows projected across a room. So let's look at the mesh and metal shadow patterns. That's going to tell us if these units are successful in doing that. If we do slices of each photograph from the testing site like we did with the cone shadows, the results are a bit muddled as you can see. The far right slice has the best representation of the shape of the metal screen, but it isn't quite ideal. If you move over to the left by two slices, we are getting what appears to be a somewhat sharp pattern, but it is the inverse of what we were expected. The crisscross pattern is light while the cutout holes are dark. Almost all of these projections contain a pattern, which tells us that there's at least some linear parallel rays passing through the cutout and letting us know that the light is coming through a grid of some type. But light waves are complicated and what we're seeing are overlays of umbra and penumbra and nothing is quite as crisp as we desired. All of these units are projecting some simulacrum of the pattern, so we can assume for our imaginary small film set that we would see shadows of water rolling down the back wall. But only the furthest right slice, the apparent sharpest, would probably have the fidelity to project the smallest of the raindrops. And take a look at this slice. This is actually the Airy Orbiter, but with a industry standard 19 degree lens attached. If you don't have any red-green color blindness, you should be able to see that the pattern has actually broken up the hues of the LED source, and we're seeing an alternating pattern of magenta and green within the shadows. I assume this is because the different diodes from the source are being divided through the mesh by some sort of physics within the test. Uh, I have to admit that I don't know enough about this phenomenon to explain it, but it, it seems worth noting that the Airy Orbiter plus a projection lens combination could have aberrations if used in certain situations. Airy does offer their own projection optics, seen on their website here, and perhaps this aberration does not happen with their proprietary lens paired with the orbiter. And without further ado, here are the labels for the slices. Here are the cone slices and the pattern slices on top of each other. 
The two perceived sharpness tests do somewhat align, as you can see. However, it's not exactly as you might have guessed. We're going to look at the units that appeared to be in the top three in both sets of tests. Two are LED, and one is a classic tungsten unit. If any of these units are going to be declared the sharpest of this test, it's going to be the unit that can actually project the fine mesh pattern, which we haven't looked at yet. Looking at the pattern from the Nanlux Evoke 1200, which was clean without a modifier, we see a fairly defined metal pattern, although, as noted earlier, the shadow appears inverted from what we expect. Unfortunately, we do not get any fine mesh pattern carried across the six feet. Second place appears to be the Aperture 300D Mark II with the Hyper Reflector Cone. The pattern of the metal is somewhat discernible, although the edges are smeary. More importantly, if we look closely, we can just make out the pattern of the fine mesh. Uh, due to compression, I'm not certain how it will resolve in this internet video. But I can assure you that the shadow of the mesh is just resolved on the test surface. And our first place winner in this test of perceived sharpness is the classic 2K open face tungsten lamp. The machine cut metal pattern is present, although with some extra noise. And when we look at the mesh projection, there is indeed a projected pattern of mesh against the white card. Why does the 2K seem to have echoes? The shadows are displayed more than once. If we look at the lamp's reflector, we can see why. The sharpness of the point source is being projected multiple times by the different rings of the unit's reflector. Something else of note, the three units that appeared to have the sharpest shadows were inversely the three units with the lowest foot candle measurements at the test platform. The Nanlux was reading at about 110 foot candles when unmodified. Uh, the second place Aperture 300D was reading at 64 foot candles when at full brightness. And our winning 2K tungsten lamp was only reading at 50 foot candles. The reason for this is likely related to what we discovered with the shadows that had the addition of the 19 degree projection lenses. When hardware is added to help get as many photons as possible aimed in one direction, the reflectors, lenses, and parabolic mirrors are increasing the area of the point source because they're re-aiming stray light into the direction that is wanted. It makes the unit more efficient by redirecting as much light forward as possible, but all of those additions of correction are increasing the perceived area of the source and thus are decreasing the crispness of a single point source. I'd imagine that a tungsten bulb floating in the air without any reflector around it would probably create a very sharp shadow and none of the shadow echoes we saw with the 2K's reflector in this test. But all of the light not aimed at the subject would be flying off into space unfocused. This is a test I would repeat again, but with some improvements. Next time I would work with an assistant or a collaborator. Funton was a huge help, but they are running a busy and successful business, and so I did a lot of set work on my own. I was up on a ladder by myself at times, aiming units, and having someone down at the platform to confirm the aim and the sharpness would be much better. And clearly there are dozens of other lights out there. There are other units we could test, there are other modifiers and attachments we could look at, there is likely something out there that can do what the 2K Tungsten did at a short distance. And as LED units get brighter and more compact, they will probably be able to deliver a very bright point source that can project parallel rays more efficiently than Tungsten or HMI. Next time I would also work a little harder to box out any extraneous work light from the test area so the photos had the best contrast possible. If you found this video useful, please like it. Uh, you can subscribe if you want. This is my first video, but if I get a positive response, I'll, I'll do more in the future. And if you see any mistakes or you think there was an omission or a correction or you have any notes, go ahead and leave it in the comments below. Um, I think professional peers collaborating and checking each other's work is a good thing. Uh, this was a test that I hadn't seen before and I thought it was interesting and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.